So the goal of this talk is to get you up to speed on what's going on in the world of cell network security, dispel some common myths, particularly around MC catchers, and to explain why it's so hard to fix some of the fundamental issues in phone radio security. Specifically, we're going to look at the root cause behind many of the cell, ne cell network attacks from the last few years, and also discuss issues the research community has been dealing with while trying to address these issues. We're going to start out by talking about MC catchers because it's a topic that's both technically and politically relevant, but ultimately the scope of this talk will be quite a bit broader. So you may have heard of stingrays or MC catchers, or by their more general term, uh, cell site simulators. These are devices that masquerade as cell towers in order to collect information from nearby phones. Very little is known about commercial MC catchers. They're shrouded in secrecy because they're only sold to law enforcement and federal agencies under very strict NDAs by the device manufacturers. And the secrecy has resulted in there being a slew of confusion and myths about what these devices are actually capable of. So here is one of the few images um, of one that exists in the public domain. Admittedly, this is for an older model called the Stingray, which is made by Harris Corp. Um, in practice, they are used for both targeted and dragnet surveillance. Uh, as for what scale they operate on when it comes to dragnet surveillance, there's some leaked marketing materials for a model called the Triggerfish, which is also made by Harris Corp, which advertises that it can collect signaling data from 60,000 devices simultaneously. We also know from Canadian public records that certain commercial MC catchers have a functioning range of at least two kilometers. So there have been <clears throat> many high profile cases regarding the use of MC catchers in the last few years. You may, you may remember last year that news broke that there were MC catchers all over DC being used to spy on politicians and lawmakers, but that the government didn't have the resources to figure out where they were or how to find them. We also know that they're being used by CBP and ICE to hunt down undocumented immigrants. ACLU recently requested documents regarding these agencies' use of these devices, which we know they possess because in a 2016 government oversight report, uh, they reported having spent $13 million on this technology. Ultimately, they didn't turn over any documents, and so the ACLU recently filed a lawsuit in response. So despite not knowing much about the technical inner workings and capabilities of modern commercial MC catchers, we do, however, know uh, the like how the original MC catchers worked from patent documents. Um, but uh, I'm about to go over that, but before I do, I need to go over some terminology to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so first, when I say base station, that's a more general term for cell tower, or anything that behaves like a cell tower, including MC catchers. In terms of network generations, the relevant ones I'll be talking about are GSM, LTE, and 5G. So GSM is the oldest cell network standard still in use, uh, and is referred to as being part of 2G. Uh, LTE is a more modern set of cell network standards, which I'd say is the most commonly used cellular standard for phones currently, uh, and it is referred to as being part of, the, as part of 4G. Uh, some of the main differences between LTE and GSM include faster data rates um, and better transit encryption algorithms, if you're curious. And then there's 5G, the newest standard, of which the first draft was finalized in March 2018. The defining improvements uh, are really just higher data rates and increased capacity on the network. So <clears throat> first, uh, why are they called MC catchers? Um, so they're called that because there's a unique ID on each SIM card called an MC. This ID is meant to be kept secret because it can be used to identify users. Um, so here's, I'm gonna go over a greatly simplified example of how the original MC catching attack worked uh, in GSM. So basically phones are always like constantly scanning, looking for a base station broadcasting at the highest signal strength. Uh, and once a phone has identified a base station as having the best signal strength, it can begin the process of negotiating a connection to it. One of the first things that happens when uh, this connection is being set up is the network requests the phone's MC uh, in order to verify that the phone belongs to a paying customer. The MC catcher here pretends to be the network and requests this MC. The phone responds with this MC because it doesn't have a way of verifying that it's talking to a real tower. Uh, and now the MC catcher has collected the MC and can move on to the next phone. So notice that the key detail here is the phone didn't have a way of telling if it was talking to a real tower or not. It was simply okay with anything that sort of seemed like a cell tower broadcasting in the right frequency range that was sending the right signaling data. And so what can an attacker do with the MC now that they have it? Well, if it's law enforcement, they can use it to get a warrant to get more information about you, or they can continuously track what areas you've been in, what areas you haven't been in, and so on. 
<clears throat> and this simplified example is also the basis of more severe privacy leaking attacks in GSM, LTE, and 5G that have been discovered by security researchers in recent years. So what other types of cell network attacks build on this one? So there's the often cited communication interception attacks from GSM. Many people worry about MC catchers being able to intercept their SMS messages, but as far as we know, these types of attacks haven't been possible since GSM, and they're not as relevant anymore. The way these communication interception attacks worked is during the simplified MC catcher attack we just saw, the MC catcher just tells the phone to either not use encryption uh, or it picked a really weak encryption algorithm that could be broken in real time. And that's sort of the basis of the men in the middle attack it sets up to be able to intercept and decrypt uh, communications. Also, to be clear, the ability to intercept uh, SMS, uh, SMS messages this low in the stack doesn't mean stuff like HTTPS or Signal or WhatsApp encryption is broken. And this is a very common misconception I hear about all the time. Um, the contents of your communications are safe from MC catchers if you are using WhatsApp, Signal, or HTTPS. Um, so, on to other attack types. So, then there are location tracking attacks, which are the mo most widely used attack, given how often they are used by commercial MC catchers, primarily by law enforcement. Uh, so, these involve either just collecting MCs, like we saw earlier, like who's present in a given geographic area, um, and, but then there are also more specific targeted attacks, like being able to figure out a target's exact physical location. Um, then there are service denial attacks in which there are special commands that can be sent to phones to cause them to stop trying to connect to the network completely uh, or to completely disable access to specific services. And then there are downgrade attacks where if you've set your phone to primarily use, say, LTE when available, then it's very easy for an MC catcher to say, oh, LTE isn't available or supported, and your phone will immediately downgrade. Uh, and once you've been downgraded to an earlier protocol, then there's like more like types of attacks that can be carried out because you're like on an older, less secure version. So the main thing that these attacks all have in common is that they rely on phones being willing to talk to fake base stations masquerading as legitimate cell towers. In other words, they're only possible because phones can't authenticate towers early on during the connection procedure, and so they have to somewhat blindly trust whoever they're communicating with for a bit. And it's no longer just MC catcher style attacks that are benefiting from this early stage, this lack of early stage authentication. You may have heard earlier this year that the presidential alert system is vulnerable to spoofing attacks. Basically anyone with some relatively affordable radio equipment within range can send fake emergency alerts. Um, you might remember the chaos from a few years ago when an accidental test presidential alert was sent out in Hawaii, warning of the incoming ballistic missile. And this is the same warning system for which it's very easy to spoof messages. Um, so how does this presidential spoofing alerts attack actually work? Uh, so cell towers are always broadcasting a set of unencrypted messages called system information broadcast messages, or SIB messages for short, at set intervals of time. These are the messages that phones read to get the necessary information needed to connect to a tower or to get updates about their connection. There are several SIBs dedicated to emergency notifications and alerts, um, most notably SIB 10 to SIB 12, which you can see here on the screen. So SIB 10 and 11 are primarily used for earthquakes and tsunamis, and SIB 12 is the one used for presidential threat and ember alerts. So I'm gonna skip over a bunch of details for the sake of time, but basically, an attacker just needs to be able to craft a SIB 12 message with whatever fake emergency text they want and send it out. And nearby phones will go, go off with the emergency alert. It's pretty easy to craft SIB messages using an open source tool like SRS LTE. So SRS LTE is an open source implementation of the LTE stack um, and broadcast it using a computer connected to a radio called uh, an SDR or software defined radio, which costs around $200 for like a decent one. Um, so at this point, uh, a question that commonly comes up is why don't cell towers just cryptographically sign their messages? Or why can't we solve this problem using digital certificates like we did with SSL and HTTPS? And that's exactly what the cell network security research community started asking a few years ago. So designing and implementing like a, a PKI-based digital certificate system for, both, for an arbitrary number of both domestic and international phones is a hard problem. Many of us know from first-hand experience 
how hard maintaining PKI is, even when it's internal to just a single organization. And here we're looking for a solution that scales nationally and potentially even internationally, since we want to be able to continue to support uh, like international phone roaming like we already do. So last year, some researchers from Purdue and the University of Iowa published this paper titled Insecure Connection Bootstrapping in Cellular Networks, the Root of All Evil, which investigates the first steps towards using digital certificates to solve the issue of the lack of authentication in cell networks. They even built a small working prototype, which they tested out in the lab. Um, so I'm going to go over some of the challenges they highlighted with using digital certs to fix this lack of authentication in cell networks. Um, so the first thing is, it's going to take a long time for phones to all be able to support this newer technology. So the main thing that we have to think about is maintaining backwards compatibility when designing and implementing the system. So what does maintaining backwards compatibility mean in practice, according to these researchers? Well, at the most basic level, it means that you can add fields to existing broadcast messages, but you can't take, over, you can't take any away. And you can't, also can't go over the maximum transmission size which is basically the maximum size of a radio packet. Uh, in particular, the researchers pointed out that you can't fit the entire X509 certificate chain in the relevant broadcast messages. So they actually had to come up with a different encoding scheme and drop some information. Um, backwards compatibility, com compatibility also unfortunately means being able to downgrade to a protocol that doesn't support this authentication scheme, similar to how many websites supported both HTTP and HTTPS before transitioning to HTTPS only. It just means that MC catchers would still be able to pull off their attacks in this transition period. Um, then there's a question of, where is the user going to store their trusted certs? Will they go on the phone, the SIM card, or somehow a mix of both? Users don't easily have control over what gets written to their SIM card by network operators. I think a lot of people don't know about this, uh, but there are over-the-air messages that can be sent to phones to modify the contents of the SIM card on your phone that network operators use. In particular, if a network operator decides to comply with an organization to say, deliver a malicious cert to a user's SIM card from that organization to be able to man in the middle of the user's connection, then the user would have no way of knowing. Um, then there's the issue of dealing with roaming, uh, which is critical to get right, because everyone has to roam to maintain connectivity while traveling, often even when you're only traveling a very short distance. However, it's not possible for a phone or a SIM card to have every cert it needs installed to handle all the carriers it might encounter, encounter while roaming. I mean, browsers don't really need to do this either. That's why we have sets of trusted routes and you know, like cross-signing and certificate chains and so on. But exactly how this ecosystem would be set up when it comes to cellular network carriers is something no one has really explored in depth yet. And then there's also problems with replay attacks and certificate revocation. Um, so, like the normal techniques like OCSP and certificate revocation lists don't adapt nicely to cell networks, but the details of that are beyond the scope of this talk. So, if you're interested in more details on how they propose solving this, I highly suggest reading this paper. While I don't necessarily agree with every technical decision they propose, I think it's honestly one of the best things to happen in cellular radio security um, in the last few years. And even though it's going to be very difficult to solve this issue for cell networks, I wholeheartedly believe that we can eventually do it just like we did with the web. So even though cell network security research is finally starting to really take off and people are starting to pay attention to these issues and propose solutions, researchers in this field still face a lot of unique challenges. Uh, so for example, uh, phone firmware is closed source, so everyone relies on open source implementations running on SDRs to simulate a phone talking to a network. The kind of radio equipment you need to do good research is still quite expensive. For example, the most basic soft SDR or software-defined radio uh, you can buy if you want to seriously do work in this field is about $400, but then you also need multiple SDRs, antennas, cables, shielding equipment, and so on. And costs add up and it becomes very expensive very quickly. Uh, and so often the legality of doing research in this field isn't clear and it tends to vary wildly by one's location. So doing work in this field uh, often requires broadcasting on parts of the spectrum, which in the United States uh, are reserved for FCC licensed devices, and your SDRs are not FCC licensed. Uh, in some parts of the world, you're not even allowed to passively scan parts of the spectrum re reserved for cellular communications like GSM or LTE, and doing so comes with heavy fines and potentially even jail time. <laughs> 
uh, at least one security researcher was jailed in Tunisia for simply possessing a basic $10 SDR within the last year. Um, and then there's the issue of reading cell network specs. It is extremely difficult, much more difficult than reading RFCs. Uh, there are many sprawling documents all over the place, and it's not always clear how different parts of these systems interoperate, or even what versions are in use where. When it comes to finding vulnerabilities in real cell networks, every carrier implements things differently, sometimes even wildly differently. A lot of what ends up in the specs, especially when it comes to security features, ends up being marked as optional for implementation. So you just never know uh, what like, a particular carrier, carrier will have implemented um, and of course, there's also issues with errors, errors being introduced in implementation. So stepping back a bit, uh, earlier I mentioned that the rate of security research in this field is advancing quite rapidly. Uh, so here's a graph that demonstrates how fast research has been advancing. Uh, so to break it down, so the GSM standards were drafted in the late 80s, and no major vulnerabilities were publicly released until the first one was found in 2006. Uh, and then the next one in 2010. So it took about 10 years from standardization to deployment um, for, GS, for the first GSM security issues to be found. Uh, so similarly, uh, the LTE standards were finalized around 2007, and LTE networks started being deployed around 2011. It only took a few years after for security researchers to be able to identify the first uh, public vulnerabilities in 2015. So only a four year gap this time, as opposed to the 10 year gap we saw with GSM. So fast forward to 5G. Uh, the first draft of the 5G standards uh, were finalized in March 2018, and within 11 months of publication, at least six critical security vulnerabilities were found by researchers, and this was before there were even any commercial 5G networks deployed. Um, and also more importantly, several studies were recently published highlighting the fact that 5G protocols are still vulnerable to the majority of uh, exploits existing in LTE because the main root cause namely pre-authentication messages, has been carried over to 5G. Uh, and just to re reiterate, the main reason why security research in this field has really taken off is because there's finally good open source software and somewhat affordable hardware to do this kind of radio security research with. So as to when to expect the core issues in cell network security to be fixed, well, I don't know if you noticed when I originally put this slide up earlier, but this is a screenshot um, the screenshot was a preprint from the Mobisys conference in South Korea, and the track it was presented in was titled Waiting for 7G, because that's probably how long it's going to take to get some of these core authentication issues fixed. All right, so in conclusion, pre-authentication messages are what enable MC catcher style attacks, MC, sorry, MC catcher style network attacks, uh, emergency alert spoofing attacks, and some other attacks I didn't have time to cover in this presentation. So as for next steps uh, of what we can do to like work on making things better. Uh, I think more of an effort to make both this field uh, and research in this field more accessible uh, would be tremendously helpful. There are almost no good publicly accessible educational resources if you're interested in learning about this stuff. I've even been told stories that if you're hired as an engineer, if you're hired as an engineer at certain telcos, they first put you in full-time classes for the first few months before you're actually allowed to start working because that's how steep the learning curve is. Uh, I think more research on appropriate authentication schemes uh, for cell networks, um, and more importantly, doing the experimental implementation work and making sure phones can still function, given all the constraints they have to deal with, uh, would be incredibly helpful. Uh, more serious development of open source tools to do work in this field. Uh, while there are solutions right now that I talked about before that have been responsible for the explosive growth um, of research in this field, such as SRS LTE for LTE, and the open air interface for 5G, a lot of them are still quite bare bones and only support very specific versions uh, of the network protocols. Um, another thing that would help is more press calling out cell network vulner vulnerabilities. Carriers and standard, standards orgs have been paying attention and changing in reaction to all the recent press about cell network vulnerabilities. Uh, and finally, in addition to press, Direct pressure from big tech companies that have the power to influence the specs is important too. There's been a history of researchers reporting critical vulnerabilities to standards orgs and them not getting fixed or even being acknowledged because the standards orgs don't always prioritize user privacy. And I think that's a particular area where big tech companies could have some, could have some influence. <laughs>
Yeah, anyway, that's all I could fit into 20 minutes on this pretty big topic. Uh, it's time for questions.